of functional assessment of the shoulder uh, versus what we very typically do in clinical practice or in orthopedic practice, where we assess the shoulder in isolation of a lot of special tests, maybe chasing a diagnostic label, but not really informing what our management needs to be for an individual conservatively. Now, some of us have met, and if not, a little, just a little about me. Yes, I've trained in Australia and the United States. I've been in practice for approaching 30 years. I've been teaching for quite a while, and, it's, and especially in the post-professional space, so post-doctoral residency and fellowship training. So today, what I really want you to attend to get from this, and if you watch this on recording, and, and if, you have your, if you have your question sessions in, in WhatsApp or other discussion forums of ISONs, just start thinking about functional assessment of the shoulder versus what we might typically do in a physical therapist practice. And also to recognize that the functional plane of motion of the shoulder, um, be the scapular plane, is very different than, than any cardinal plane assessment we might choose to do. And this has a big impact on clinical utility in terms of what it is we're actually finding out and how useful that is that to us in putting together a rehabilitation plan. So I might talk about a few special tests that are useful uh, with regards to looking at upper extremity pain. And now I know that slide says neural, that should say um, due to uh, upper extremity pain due to functional impairment, not neural involvement, I apologize. And if I might show a few videos and I'll probably talk over the videos as I go. So the technology is always interesting. And so I'll do that so you can know what's happening in the video. So just some guiding principles to a functional approach for the shoulder. The shoulder functions really to bring the hand into position, not to bring the shoulder into position. Uh, it's a basic concept, and sometimes it gets lost on physios, that really it's hand elevation. It's not shoulder elevation, and it's hand placement. That so, And we do it both in an open and a closed chain. But when we overhead lift, we don't really do that using the shoulder girdle primarily. We do that by positioning the hand and then driving through the trunk and the lower extremities. Now, and the and bilateral function in the upper extremities that's symmetrical is really quite unusual. We very rarely do tasks that are directly, where both upper extremities are doing the exact same thing at the same time. They're normally moving opposite to each other, but yet our rehabilitation approaches and our assessments are often done presuming symmetrical function. And that's problematic. And if you think about walking or running, your arms swing in opposite directions. That's the economy and the efficiency of human motion, but it's very rarely seen as a primary thought process in how we assess the shoulder, especially with elevation of the upper extremity. So we need a rehab approach that's premised on the restoration of function, but if it's based upon non-functional movement, it'll probably produce a limited outcome. And so the more challenged someone is to use their upper extremity, the more it really calls on us to assess them and try to rehab them in a way that's as close to normal function as possible versus arbitrary approaches to function that might be convenient for our assessment, that might make it easier for us as examiners, but makes it harder for them as a person to perform. And you'll see some examples. And this last point, cervical and thoracic cage function is critical to optimal shoulder girdle function. And it needs to be screened and managed. This does not happen with most of our peers in the medical community. It's an expertise we can have in physiotherapist practice. But we are integrating cervical thoracic function and scapular, cervical scapular function into upper extremity assessment and performance tasks instead of isolated shoulder movements. Because that's not how you would choose to use your arm, your upper extremity. You wouldn't choose to trap your arm by your side and just try to, in an isolated fashion, use your arm without using your trunk or stabilizing from your neck. So just to cut a few thoughts to get us going. How does your hand arrive at a set location? If I reach for a drink in front of me or across, like if I have a beverage, um, the first thing that really happens is my cervical spine stabilizes my, my foot, stabilizes. My thoracic cage starts to rotate. My scapula starts to move around my thoracic cage to reach. My delta doesn't pull my scapula forward. 
what happens is that basically the upper extremity to some extent is a bit of a passion that's pushed by the scapula moved on the trunk. If you start looking at looking at human motion, like one of the ways to really understand how the shoulder girdle functions is to watch fencing or similar activities. And you'll see that the position of the human body is extremely dynamic. If the right arm is advancing or the left arm is advancing, the opposite arm is pulling back behind. You do not see individuals in fencing put both hands forward and push both arms straight ahead. Everything is in opposites. Then, and so the functional performance is dependent upon a lot of moving components. And I say there's no strings attached. Think about the way we sometimes use pulleys. Pulleys are actually quite complex in regards to restoring shoulder function, but the way we often use them is not so complex and is actually harmful. As I've mentioned, <clears throat> bilateral symmetrical shoulder function is not usual. It's quite unusual. But yet, if you walk around a physiotherapy gym, you'll often see people being tasked to do bilateral tasks, such as grab TheraBand and pull them straight both back. What motion are you trying to prepare someone for when you do that? There isn't many motions that require that. In essence, we are powered through opposing motions, such as in this prior slide, to thrust with the right arm forward for the fencer here, the left arm pulls the trunk and rotates the thoracic cage in an optimal direction. So the scapula can, the muscles of the scapula can push that humerus and drive the arm forward. It's because I think about robots. So for those watching the recording, we missed about 30 seconds there, but just to repeat, what the transition I've made as a clinician 25, 30 years has been to try to get into a situation where when I start assessing someone's shoulder function, I'm doing it from the concept of looking at what is the optimal way that individual could function. Special tests get tied to that, but they don't drive it because the special tests which as I'll discuss coming up, have some limitations. They have utility, but they have limitations. I like to start with the end in mind. I would like an individual to be able to use their right arm most efficiently, pick up, cup, utilize maybe for a drink. Then I need to assess the function of that arm, where they're going to use it and how they use it. I'm not gonna trap the arm by the side and try to assess function where they won't actually use the arm as soon as they leave the clinic. So what, because if this is needed, if you need this type of dynamic upper extremity activity, why do we do these type of activities? You could make an argument about like baseline strength development, but in essence, when I look at many of these isolated shoulder exercises or interventions PT do, they're actually untraining someone's shoulder girdle because that is not how you'll use it when you try to do a dynamic task. This is diagonal split opposite functions, arm, arms moving in opposite directions. Whereas in this case, you're literally taking away a lot of the elements to support upper extremity function. Again, I know you can make an argument, build a baseline strength potentially, but there's ways you could do that. And that would be a much longer talk, but there's ways you could do upper extremity motor retraining that also mimic function. But let's look at functional assessment then. So when I run workshops, I'll often put this slide up at the very beginning and say it's time for what I call a bunny trail. But really for myself, the journey was in the mid nineties. It was like watching prescribed approaches to mobilization, specific exercise post rotator cuff surgery or dysfunction for individuals. Where I was like, what are we really doing in the clinic when we tie someone's arm to their side and try and say, well, isolating your infraspinatus or we're putting you in this position to isolate posterior delt and infra when that does not happen outside of the clinic. So 
And like the cardinal plane assessment of the shoulder, assessing shoulder flexion, shoulder abduction, IR and ER in different positions, none of that's normal human movement. It comes down because Da Vinci in the 1600s developed the cardinal planes from the Vitruvian man, but we don't move that way. So in this, I, I've tried to simplify for myself the initial pass through shoulder assessment. I make it functional and I can do a little demonstration of assessing functionally shoulder performance in the functional planes. And I'll word this over because I assume it won't be heard. So for this individual, I was looking at assessing their motion in a way that is more purposeful. That would be looking at a classic flexion-based assessment, but here I'm putting the person in what would be a position of scaption and noting the simp simplified elevation that occurs. This is an individual with some weakness in upper girdle motor control. So if I then place the individual in classic flexion and simply say, can you maintain your arm in flexion? It's actually very hard to maintain your arm in flexion, even against resistance, but it's a lot simpler to do it in scaption because that's the natural position of the shoulder. Now, if you bend your elbow in flexion and then look at resisted rotation, it's very difficult to do because supraspinalis and the periscapular muscles are at a large mechanical disadvantage. If you put someone in a scapular plane, all of a sudden their motor strength, unless they've got a primary tissue dysfunction, returns. A key thing you can look at too is when you're not in a scapular plane position, you really can't bring your hand to your mouth. But if you're in scapular plane, you simply bend your elbow, your hand will end up near your mouth. It's because that's how we function again. So the idea that I instill initially of individuals is there's a position where your shoulder truly functions. That's where I'm going to assess you. I'm not going to put you in arbitrary positions of cardinal plane assessment, which do not replicate how you'll use your upper extremity in your real world. And that'll be the premise that I move forward with them when I start to assess them in the clinic. So this position of the arm by the side, this position right here, where if you bend your elbow, your hand touches the mouth and you're in scaption is the natural base position I start shoulder assessment. Now, if someone's had a traumatic injury and they can't put their arm there, I'll do something a little different. I get that. But this is where we function. And scaption is actually quite of a large plane. It's not just 30 degrees forward. It's where, it's where the humerus has a perpendicular mid-shaft alignment to the glenoid. And as long as you can move your scapula, you will you stay in scaption. Nearly all shoulder function occurs in scaption because the scapula simply moves to match where the humerus is and the muscle ten tension relationships thus stay optimal, which there allows human performance to be optimal. So if you assess someone in pure flexion, their strength, you're assessing them where they won't use their arm. If you assess someone in pure abduction, unless they have a lot of external rotation of the scapula, thoracic extension, posterior right thoracic rotation, you're assessing them where they won't use their arm. It does start to become a little pointless. You can make an argument for that, okay, getting a baseline. But if you assess someone where they function throughout their arc of their function, you're getting information about how they're going to use their arm. And you can build on that. So this IRRST test position, and there'll be a later slide that talks to why I use that phrase. This position has been utilized as a nice way to screen the shoulder. Basically, if you put someone in this position and they're weaker in external rotation than internal rotation, you've got some pretty good confidence that there's a rotator cuff dysfunction involved if it's external rotation weakness. And if it's internal rotation weakness, you've got some pretty good confidence that it's intra-articular, be it glenohumeral arthritis, be it labral dysfunction, be it chondral defect, be it glenoid trauma, be it Oh, and also, or subscapularis, yes, I know, rotator cuff on ER weakness would not be predominantly subscap. Now, if it's unclear, if it's about the same, but the person has a shoulder impairment, then you might want to think about biceps function. 
because it is both intra and extra articular. Now, functional assessment though. I make the note, how about cervical spine and thoracic spine function? I put someone here to compare side to side the shoulder motor control. I will try to work out, can that individual optimally perform in that position? What's that mean? It would be, oh, you have weakness in one direction. What happens to that weakness if I give you much, give you an improved cervical posture or engage your craniocervical motor control? Do all of a sudden your shoulder functions improve? If your shoulder function improves after I facilitated motor control in your cervical spine or your thoracic posture, now I know that I need to focus on cervical motor control or thoracic postural position as a means to rehab the shoulder function instead of purely looking at the shoulder. The biceps, <coughs> I mentioned the biceps load test. It's a very useful one, why? Classically, it's been described as a way to look at long head of biceps dysfunction. The individual on the table, if you have a person was sitting up, they're here. They're actually in a relatively functional position. They can reach their face. They're in scapular plane. And about that, if you put someone in biceps load and you further rotate them such that you actually make it a little bit like an apprehension test. So here's the question. Is the bicep someone's friend or foe with regards to their shoulder function? If you put someone in an apprehension test, which you classically look at anterior instability, but if you put them in the apprehension test and then you rotate them externally, and you can do it in scapular plane, to the point where they start feeling apprehensive, if you then resist biceps flexion, biceps function, and they no longer feel apprehensive, their biceps is functioning and it's their friend. If you do that resisted test and they get more apprehension or it doesn't help them, biceps is a problem. You might have a peel back injury in the long head of the biceps. You might have a slap tear. You might have fraying. But regardless, what the person doesn't have is the ability to use their biceps to overcome any instability of their shoulder girdle. So you're starting to get a quick picture. Is it rotator cuff external? Is it intraarticular? Is your biceps your friend or your foe? And you can build on top of that, looking at if I position your thoracic spine, will you stabilize your cervical spine? Does your dysfunction decrease in your arm? Because you're starting to think like the rehab clinician instead of trying to put a diagnostic label on somebody. So many individuals, yes, they might have shoulder pain, but if you give them good motor control, you help position them better, immediately in clinic, they're performing better on similar tasks that they'll have to do at home or in the workplace. And they're already starting to get a strategy of how they could avoid hurting themselves. It's like, okay, I need to make sure I'm in this nice functional position when I use my arm, instead of sticking my arm over here and looking away and trying to function like this. There's this algorithm that by Nicholas Biderwolf, former postdoctoral student that I worked with, basically utilized that exact IRIST test as a means to do an initial screening of shoulder dysfunction. It was basically, let's put your arm here. Let's put you in the most functional position you can use your shoulder. Let's look at your rotational strength. Is your weakness more ER? Let's think rotator cuff. Then you can apply all the rotator cuff special tests you like. You can do lag signs, drop signs. You can do also, you can do lift off tests. That's fine. Or if it's more inter, internal, to in, interarticular directed, then you can apply labral tests. You can do grind tests, clunk tests. You can do shear, kim, jerk, whatever you wish. There's a lot of them, but you can keep it simple too if you wish. And if it's not, if it's not obviously one or the other, then start thinking biceps, long head biceps. AC joints, obvious, person points to it. But the biceps function is critical to shoulder function because it's both internal and external of the joint. And as you progressively move external rotation of the scapula, which you call towards abduction, itching an anterior in the shoulder girdle. So, the other critical piece of a functional assessment for the shoulder girdle is a construct that I call finding the scapular window. What does that mean? I want to try and say it in a simple way. In a someone, if someone's 
shoulder girdle is functioning well. Arm eleva hand elevation, they can do, they can generate force, they can do lots of things with their upper extremity. What they will have is the ability to stay in scaption and motor control in a large arc. They will be able to use their muscle function to rotate their scapula anterior, posteriorly, tilt it, upwardly, downwardly, rotate as much as they need. But keep the humerus centered on the glenoid so they can use their thoracic musculature, chest wall musculature, to move the glenoid, move the scapula around to face wherever the arm needs to be and maintain motor control through the cuff, serratus and other motor groups to hold the humerus firmly on, centered on the glenoid, so the arm will function well in the upper, in, in, up in space. How do you find out how big that window is? First, you find where someone's optimal midpoint is, and then you assess, you move, in, you move a little bit into the IR of the scapula or adduction in the frontal plane, and you see, does their motor control stay? At what point does the individual lose their ability to have motor control in that window, okay? You can, as you get better at it, constantly refine and affect thoracic cage position, circle motor control, even pelvic alignment, pelvic and trunk position as you assess it. Somebody who has a very small window of function, like they can hold their cup and function right here. As soon as you bring them back, they can't really do it anymore. If you bring them across, they can't really do it anymore. Has a very small window of function. That person might have dyskinesis where they can't stay in scapular motor control, or they may have a specific, they may have a, they may have a more advanced tissue trauma through the joint. That means they've got a very small window they can function in. Okay. But basically the goal for some of them, when I work with them is they have a large scapular window that they can function in because the world is not gonna prevent every, present every demand to the shoulder girdle conveniently in one position. You'll have to reach behind you in a car, have to pick up a suitcase at different angles. All right. So I look to determine where, how big of a window of function an individual has side to side. And I compare them individually, not together. And when I do it, I keep the, I keep the person more, more neutral towards supinated because that optimally positions the rotator cuff versus impinging it if you turn them into pronation in the forearm. So yeah, functional quick tests are nice. You can use them in the shoulder girdle, but the functional quick test for an individual might combine cervical rotation away, such as the individual driving. Or for the, I like the picture of the young child reaching up. It's the classic picture noting that when you really want to reach high of one arm, the other one doesn't reach up at the same time. Okay. So some questions that might be popping up as I work through this. So I want to try and address them in flow. Do we just stop using special tests if we complete a shoulder functional exam? Now, I know I included biceps and the Zaslov or the IRIST and what I just showed, but I didn't give you a list of 20 different special tests to do. You don't stop doing special tests when doing a functional assessment, but you put them in their place and their place is that they are isolated. Special tests of the shoulder are typically diagnosis focused. They're not management focused. They're not really designed to tell you how to manage the individual. Even an apprehension test, you might think, well, that tells me the shoulder's unstable. But it doesn't really tell you, does the biceps provide a supporting function the way I showed you the, the modification you can use of the, putting the two together would. And they special tests predominantly implicate a tissue structural impairment. They don't, instead of identifying how to conservatively manage, they don't tell you the person needs cranio-cervical motor control, they need deep neck flexion motor control to improve the arm, or they need to pre-position the thoracic spine in more kyphosis or more upright into extension to best function in the upper extremity. We can work that out by doing a functional assessment. You're not gonna work it out for the standard special tests. So you'd use them as much as you wish, but be aware of the limitations and they're quite large. What about directly observing movement in the shoulder girdle? If you watch an individual bilaterally, you might see on the left side here, the dysfunction in downward rotation, it's delayed and then it'll, then it'll catch up. 
problem with this assessment, even though it's a classic way of looking at dyskinesis, and this individual does have left-sided serratus dysfunction, eccentrically, is that the functional, what's happening in the right arm is affecting the left arm. And if the, I ask this person to pick a weight off a shelf and to bring it down with their left arm, they're not going to lift their right arm up at the same time and then try and lift them together. They're going to only lift their left arm and they're going to allow then the musculature of the thoracic spine and cage to support the left arm. Because when you use your left arm in elevation or coming back down, there is rotation and side bending in the thoracic cage and spine that occurs. That's the opposite to what would occur for supporting the right arm. If you try and support both arms at the same time, you very much limit what you can do to support the arm with a thoracic cage. So yes, I know we assessed that. I, I look at it a little. I have to keep that in mind. Now, even if you look at a closed chain assessment of an individual who might on the right side on repeated fatigue start to develop scapular liftoff, as this person has post-significant medical trauma and uh, blood clotting and other things, they get a very quick shake and facilitation response on the right side in, the peri in, in bilateral, in closed chain. But I will say that if I assess this unilaterally, the person won't, will roll straight off the ball. They won't even be able to hold the ball on the wall. So closed chain is a little bit more than we do bilateral, but not much in open chain. And this has implications quite large into how you do manual therapy interventions. It's not about manual therapy today, but if I'm going to mobilize someone's shoulder girdle into elevation, maintaining it in the functional scapular plane the whole time, it's going to look a little bit different than just trapping the arm by the side. I'm going to have to move diagonally around that shoulder to create elevation through, through and yes, and I'm using a rotational mobilization to bring that arm into a higher position of elevation instead of doing a straight cardinal plane intervention. So PK, did you want to mention your manual therapy batch four? We've just got a few slides left, but I thought you might want to mention it. Sure, sir, sure. Uh, yeah, sure, I appreciate that. And that was quite informative. Uh, guys, I mean, I already shared the information on, uh, on the WhatsApp group. But guys, uh, we have our manual therapy batch four starting this October. Dr. Stephen Fort uh, from USA, he will be taking our first class in October 29th on the basic and advanced foundations of manual therapy. So in order to get some information about this manual therapy program, you can see on our website, the isom.com. And there will be a quiz after this lecture. So we'll be sharing the quiz link in the WhatsApp group so that you can have more information on the website as well as in the WhatsApp group, sir. All right, thank you. All right, and so just a few comments I'll make. Uh, I might like the functional assessment is a way then to sort of build a, build a way to then start conservative rehabilitation for an individual with shoulder girdle problem that is a lot more focused on how we naturally move again, but it does make exercise applications more difficult. So I won't play all the way too much, but some of our fellows in training, uh, other, other faculty, we work on this. Someone's getting someone early on to start retraining external rotation motor control, past rotator cuff trauma. If you use a ball in a setup, you can position someone so that they actually are using scapular plane as the start point versus a midpoint. A little bit of lower trap motor control engagement, pushing the elbow down on the ball. What the patient was testing was if she bent her own elbow, she could reach to her mouth. And so looking at the ability to generate external rotation early on whilst maintaining a depression, creating a dent on the ball, will engage the musculature to stabilize the shoulder girdle in a way that exactly how we'd want to use the arm in a daily task. Compare that to putting the arm by the side or maybe a little towel roll under your arm and doing external rotation against the trunk. And, I, and what will happen in this demonstration, and I just, I don't want to use too much time with it, but the individual was initially feeling it on top of their shoulder and in their neck, uh, the way people often do on resisted external rotation. 
But once she depressed the humerus, it became axillary motor control. It became subscapularis engagement as well. And that allowed the individual to learn to do external rotation at a way at home early on that is part of how you use the arm regularly versus trapping the arm by the side. So I know we're going a bit long. So if you just start looking at some of the pictures, these are from 20 odd years ago, we're trying to develop this concept, but coming above this position where you're looking at external, external rotation motor retraining, this is inscaption. This is over a ball having to utilize cervical multifidi, thoracic multifidi, prone motor control in that, almost like that bicep load position in reverse. And these would be some of these catch exercises where you need a diagonal angle coming over the shoulder in an open stance so that you stay in a, a motor control that emphasizes the scapular plane control whilst you're looking at external rotation. Little things like using an approach where you change the demand on the, for the individual so they always have to stay in scapular motor control during a task. In this example, what I, an exercise I often see where people just have someone slide their arm up and down the wall. That's in pure flexion, not functional. If I create a demand, the person starts to shake, you know, see if they're here. Now, if I change the person's body structure so they open the thoracic cage, they can use the right side of the thoracic cage to support. I then change, now, they now will gain a significant amount of strength and they can notice it straight away because the arm is more functional. Now, if I change the angle of pull, so it's in line with the rotation of the actual, of the rotator cuff group, now they will have far more motor control. And if I finally split their stance so that their pelvis can be neutral during the task, I should be able to pull a lot harder and not have any issues with them losing control. So it's functional training following functional assessment. Okay. So I'll show one last little one where I utilize in an individual I've assessed and I've worked out cervical motor control is deficient during the same individual had a C45 level motor control impairment that was going on during their shoulder dysfunction. So when I assessed in the scapular plane and their motor control, they had challenges with regards to C5. Like deltoid function was not really present. And so instead I would do, I mentioned this, I did some specifically motor control engagement retraining around C45 in the cervical spine because that's a key component of their upper extremity function. Once that was reset, that would be their baseline. And then it'd be like, oh, all right, now do the same demand task in your arm. And it's like, her response to the video is like, oh, wow, I'm no longer weak. And I can actually feel my neck working. That's great. So that's an example of trying to pull it together, of trying to utilize cervical motor control with regards to shoulder function at the same time. All right. So, I know the questions you'll put in your WhatsApp chat. I know I went a little long, PK, did I? No, I mean, that was good. That was quite a uh, new, this caption thing and the scapular exercises. I don't see any questions actually so far. Uh, uh, I can also email you some, Dr. McDonald, and there is some. Okay, so I'll wrap this up. I know that the, the uh, we didn't have the chat open in this particular meeting and there might questions in other places, but the classic drawing on the left there of the scapular plane, Ironically, all those other lines can also be the scapular plane if the scapula and the thoracic spine can move enough to maintain alignment. And the argument about the function of the supraspinatus and other aspects of the arm has been going since about 1640, as far as I can tell in the literature, 
And that's what that reference is on the right. So this has more been a presentation to get you thinking, to have you look at how people move through the shoulder girdle and what we do in the clinic as, as clinicians in assessing shoulder function and to be like, well, maybe there's a, we need to think about this differently. In a much longer setting, getting hands-on, you can really start to tease this out and see that our assessment of the shoulder girdle function be far more refined towards how someone moves and how someone functions in daily life than the way we go about it, which often right now is tied to purely trying to find a diagnostic label. It's not simple, it's fun. And uh, but I appreciate you taking time to listen and to think about it and look for good luck with your ongoing educational journey. And we'll stop there. I guess uh, Dr. McDonald, uh, one participant need, uh, has one question. Uh, she can kind of ask me. Uh, and Dr. McDonald, if you if you don't mind, can you just briefly summarize uh, the presentation and can go through the first slide, please, if you don't mind. Uh, that people actually some joined late. Yeah. The first slide. Yeah. Okay. Well, if if you. If you joined a little late and you're looking at this on recording, what this presentation is really is to get you thinking. So when you look back on this presentation today, it's about moving from the classic way that we clinically assess the shoulder, which is for our convenience done in cardinal planes and done with a lot of special tests, to one where they're just using a few special tests and assessing the function of the shoulder girdle where we use it, such as my right arm, I would use it here. I would reach from here. My humerus would be in scaption. My body would be stabilized. I would not be down here trying to reach. Uh, and doing and assessing in a way to be like, how involved is my cervical spine, motor control and my arm function? How involved is my thoracic cage? And until you look at upper extremity function, the shoulder girdle, uh, it, from the perspective of how does that all come together? you get a very incomplete picture of how to manage someone from a concerted approach. Yes, I can quickly identify if someone has a labral disruption, but it takes a bit of thinking to work out, is that labral dysfunction made worse because they also have cervical motor control weakness? Is it made worse because they have thoracic stiffness and they can't rotate? Is it made worse because they don't position <coughs> their trunk optimally to do tasks? And the other key part that I introduced today was that shoulder function is unilateral and it happens in opposite. Which is the way shown very much at all in life. We use dynamic movement patterns that involve the right and the left arm doing opposite tasks, allowing the thoracic spine to do two different things on, on either side of the body. My right arm goes forward, thoracic spine. If I'm going forward in more scapular plane forward, my right thoracic is rotating forward. I am getting side bending away to the left. And the opposite would happen if I move my left arm forward. So when we do bilateral tasks, we actually make our function a lot less efficient. So if we rehab bilaterally, we make it very difficult for people to succeed because we need very dynamic function in the human body to do very high demand tasks and the arms are doing opposite things when that happens, not the same. Does that help PK just as an intro? That was good, Dr. McDonald. Actually, one participant asked about the slide where the male patient was rotating externally and she has some doubts regarding that uh, slide. So can you please uh, repeat that slide for the participants, like where the male patient is externally rotating? You mean the slide on screen right now? No, not, uh, I mean, <clears throat> the different one where, uh, like, I, a guy was, male, male patient was externally rotating the shoulder. I'm trying to work out which one you mean, though, because there's quite a few. Uh, some rehab in the rehabilitation plan. Yeah, in the rehabilitation plan. So later on. <clears throat> Here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I guess so. Yeah, that's correct. And so a particular question to what Rob's doing in rotation? 
uh, they just wanted to like re request to kind of a review and repeat this exercise, please. And I did it quickly because I know I, I was using a lot of your time. But these exercise images are just examples of retraining external rotation, but in in a position where the individual is still in scaption, either a static scaption position on the right of the individual seated, or a moving diagonal scaption where the where Rob is throwing the weight over the shoulder of the individual. So they're going to have to catch it eccentrically in external rotation if it was a moving video. Or if John over the ball, more in prone, having to work on eccentric retraining of external rotation, but in a position where the periscapular muscles have to function at the same time. Now, these are just quick demonstrations I throw in of like high demand external rotation progressions for some people, but no, no one's got their arm by their side and there's no TheraBand involved. Because when you work on like external rotation retraining for the rotator cuff girdle, what you're really working on is also scapular thoracic motor control. And you're also working on timing and proprioception. Shoulder function, the shoulder is very unstable naturally. Proprioception, position sense is critical in shoulder function. When you give someone a strap that they're pulling on, you provide them proprioception through the strap. If you give them a free weight, we give them a task to complete, they don't have that. They have to actually redevelop it. So yes, the shoulder is wonderfully complicated. I was just touching on some concepts today and these are just some examples. But in the clinic, you have to get pretty creative. It's a lot of fun, but you have to get away from cardinal plane and non-functional based assessment. Hope, PK, I hope that helps. That, that, that's, that helps, sir. And uh, they also wanted to know what, what exactly is the position and the exercise that they are doing in front of the mirror. Like it's a bit uh, unclear over there. Like in front of the mirror, is that? The one up top to the right. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't really planning to talk about much exercise rehab today, but in essence, what's happening is that is a weighted ball that is being thrown that is going to travel in midair over and land just in front of the person's hand. So they have to catch the back of the ball. And then, I don't know how well my camera shows up, but if the ball is being thrown from here, I would have to catch the back of the ball, grab it, and then send it back. So I'm having to eccentrically load control and then reverse it. Sometimes it's done as a cricket warm up, baseball warm up. In a progression, I'd be in half kneeling. I'd have one knee on the floor doing it. So, but the whole concept is about proprioception, catching eccentrically in scaption, having to motor control and then concentrically return the weight. And you use your head to watch because it requires the cervical and thoracic control at the same time. It's a very high level demand task, but throwers, high level athletes, they love those type of exercises because they can actually feel their body working efficiently. Instead of give me 20 pounds resistance, dumbbell tied to your side. That's not a good exercise. So it's like a D2, D2 PNF flexion pattern, like D2 or some plyometrics we can say. Excellent, yeah, PK, you described a lot better than I did. I wasn't no, no, planning no. on ch <laughs> chatting about it, but yeah. No, D2, no. the PNF stuff is wonderful. PNF integration in the shoulder girdle really says, let's be functional. And so, yeah, if you've got a PNF background, functional shoulder assessment is far more natural for you than someone who's trying to like take a classic orthopedic approach where I'm going to do Hawkins Kennedy knees. I'm going to do like a drop arm. I'm going to do, I'm going to do like uh, the painful arc which are all done typically in non-functional positions, thus don't really give us good information. Yep. That's the, so there's a lot to it. Uh, Dr. McDowell, another part's been asked a very kind of a sweet, innocent question. I mean, do, the, do you guys use a lot of electrotherapy in Colorado and US for your shoulder rehab? Only if pain limits someone's progression. Um, actually, TENS is doing a bit of a comeback because of the aberrant pain pathways. Like people who've got very, uh, who've moved from like nociceptive pain into more 
dosoplastic pain, TENS has been quite beneficial. Now, interferential, I would use in the clinic if I needed to overcome somebody's uh, altered pain responses and it was, it was preventing their progression. So, yes, it does get used some. Uh, I do very rapidly try and get people doing functional tasks. So if somebody had an interferential unit on them, they'd be then, I'd be asked them at the same time to do functional task movements so that they are taking advantage of the pain reduction to perform optimally versus just sitting quietly. But so yeah, there's some use. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, yeah, especially when the pain level is high. And, and another participant has a similar question that what would be your good starting functional motor retraining position if the pain levels are high? It was why I showed the video of the ball. I'm yeah. like, I have people day one or two after rotator cuff surgery, I can position their arm on a ball and all they have to do is just hold it there. And it might be as simple as your hand is on, your arm's on the ball. All I want you to do is extend your wrist. So when you extend your wrists, because of that D2 pattern you brought up, your, ex, your external rotator, infraspinatus turns on. And it's also why using a band is not great sometimes for retraining rotation because the band pulls you into flexion of the wrist, but in reality, you need wrist extension to optimally externally rotate. So I'll put someone's elbow on a ball very gently and ask them just to create a dent in the ball. Now they have to engage serratus, lower trap. They're learning to stabilize the shoulder girdle right now. They could maybe just turn their wrists while they're on the ball. Mm -hmm. Or like there's, there's, there's ways to do it, but you're probably picking up on this. I don't like people's arms tucked by this side. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> Actually, people are asking a lot of questions which we teach in our manual therapy program is regional interdependence. And they are more interested in like the cervical spine, thoracic spine. Uh, Partsman asked the beautiful question that because of the postural stress uh, and the cervical spine and thoracic spine being involved, uh, is there like a functional training or some, some functional uh, plane training for like cervical spine, thoracic spine in context to shoulder. Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there is. Now, how do I answer that simply? Because it's a brilliant yeah. question. <laughs> um, too, too many questions. In what, 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 are, what I do, the reason I find it, the reason I really emphasize for individuals when I assess them, that I start in this position, like right here, when I've got Shad and Stephanie here. When I do this initial assessment, nearly everyone who's got a shoulder problem has significant weakness. Then I retrain their cervical spine as they sit there and they see an improvement in their arm function. The per Once a person can feel their cervical motor control and how it affects their arm, it becomes a lot easier then to be like, okay, you're now simply going to do arm elevation. But whilst you do your hand elevation, your arm elevation, you're going to be doing your cervical motor control training. When you do your external rotation work, you're first going to engage your cervical motor control. And so that as soon as the patient can feel how that goes together, then they themselves facilitate their own integration of cervical into upper. When someone takes their arm up and down a wall, like rolls a ball up a wall. I make a big emphasis to train the person that they feel their thoracic cage rotate to help their arm go up and down the wall. So the patient can actually feel it. Now, at a very high level, I might put a strap around the forehead such that the individual has, a, has an isometric demand to keep the head in neutral. So they could be taking their arm up and down and they've got a strap pulling them like this. And so they have to control cervical motor control whilst elevating the arm and turning the trunk. So they're doing all three at the same time, but it doesn't work unless when I first start with the person, I start with functional assessment because otherwise they can't feel it. They don't know what I'm trying to achieve. So I, so yeah, the start, it's a bit time intensive at the get go to train someone to understand how their shoulder works relative to their body. Once they can feel it, they do great exercise patterns versus having to constantly untrain them. PK, that might have worked. Yeah, that's quite an elaborate uh, functional training for neck as well as the shoulder. I mean, are you including the trunk 
uh, involvement in the rotation part. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, another question, if you if you don't mind uh, taking some more questions, uh, Dr. McDonald, will that be okay? No, it's fine. Uh, Paspan says <laughs> that he mentioned that the pain in the internal rotation is because of the intra-articular structures, and uh, in pain in the external rotation is could be because of the rotators being involved. But I mean, he's asking about the Hawkins Kennedy being sensitive to rotator cuff. I don't know. I mean, Hawkins Kennedy is more like an impingement test. Uh, so I mean, do you have anything to add on that? Because I mean, I can repeat the question if you didn't get the question. Like he said, Hawkins well, Kennedy is more sensitive to the rotator cuff, where, where, where you internally rotate the. Well, the problem with Hawkins Kennedy, like Hawkins Kennedy, I, I now I've got to be careful because I, I I mess up my own uh, special test occasions. It's only about two hundred in total. <laughs> But Hawkins Kennedy, in and of itself, is a is especially crates impingement. Like it's highly sensitive because it's so aberrant. Uh, the way I use Hawkins Kennedy sometimes is that uh, if you have a negative Hawkins Kennedy, you've got a great shoulder to be able to tolerate that position. But yes, what you can do if you're thinking that someone's weak and they they got a primary external rotation perspective, and I encourage people to get this paper from Nicholas Bidorf. Because you'll then take the next 20 tests, including Hawkins Kennedy, and you apply them to that initial screening. Okay, you've determined external rotation, the rotator cuff external rotation is a primary function. All right, you've got a 90% probability you're right at that point. Add Hawkins Kennedy, add the drop arm, add the ER lag, add the painful arc. What does that do in terms of your diagnostic confidence with regards to tissue? It increases it, sure. What does it do of how you're going to map your knowledge of how to functionally manage the person? It doesn't increase it. So I don't, yeah, Hawkins Kennedy, if I look at it, I'm going to do it in scaption because the classic way of doing it is highly, really almost creates injury. So, uh, but it's a good question that sort of talks to why special tests can still matter. But if you do them just in isolation without thinking function, you end up with, Diagnostic information that doesn't tell you how to manage the person. Yeah. So I can work out if someone's got a potato cuff function in about five seconds. Exactly. And and another part spender uh, like related to this, Dr. McDonald asked that does this apply to like a bony bengot and hill sac lesion? Sure it will, because that'll show up with significant internal rotation weakness. But if someone's got a bony bengot, how where is the clinician going to deal with that? Well or not? Can we do a ladder jab procedure in our office? No, we can't. Um, but what I'll find, if someone's got this bony bank card issue with an anterior instability, it's a great question because what it is is that person is probably going to have reasonable function right in the midpoint of scaption. But as soon as you externally rotate the scapula, they're going to start to get that anterior dysfunction. They're going to, their internal <laughs> rotation strength is going to get worse and worse. But if you can retrain the serratus, the pecs, retrain the cervical scapula and thoracic musculature, they can start to see over time, the scapular window gets better. And that means they're safer and they can do more in the world. So they may not necessarily have to have the surgical repair of the bony bank art to get back to a high level of function, but they're gonna to have to learn to turn their trunk to, to work with their arm. If their arm just goes about their trunk, that bony bank art and anterior issue gets worse. So the scapular window starts to be the way to measure their ability to return somewhat to function. And if they have actual surgical intervention to address it, they're gonna function here initially. And over time, they're gonna need, they're going to develop a bigger window they can function in. So they can eventually, if they're a sport, sports participant, be in that dynamic throwing position. So you can grow that window of function over time as well. A couple of different ways to use it. But yeah, it all applies to those same traumas. Yep. And I remember Dr. McDonald, we we did a, like an overhead throwing shoulder presentation and I was going through some of the Robert Donatelli's and Kebler's uh, references. And Robert Donatelli works a lot, like um, he mentions about uh, releasing the subscapularis and Kebler talks about all those uh, upward rotators and like a trunk rotator exercises. So, I mean, do you have anything to add on to that, those Donatelli's and Kebler's work? <laughs> Well, oh, well, Donatelli and Keebler as well. Well, the, uh, the, the scapula six syndrome assessment, dyskinesis, Keebler's work, um, useful. The challenge I give to it is it's done bilaterally. So I showed that video. It's almost a standard Keebler test. Again, where you're looking, you're trying to compare side to side what is happening of scapula upward and downward rotation and tilting. 
problem is uh, what if you have optimal support from the trunk for the right shoulder girdle, the scapula during elevation, then whatever the trunk muscles are doing to support the right scapula, to some extent, are the opposite of what they need to do to support the left scapula. So you're robbing from Paul to pay Peter. So I would say where, and that's why the intraorator reliability and the diagnostic utility of dyskinesia assessment by visual observation keeps getting worse as the years go by. But I hope they're gonna to move to a unilateral assessment. And when they start looking unilaterally, I suspect the data will start to improve. Like the scapular rotator, uh, what Donatelli and others really showed us though, I truly appreciate, to be the primary muscle that you need to look at function-wise in the shoulder girdle is, is, the, is the serratus anterior. And a primary muscle you need to look at in terms of dysfunction and aberrant shortening is the subscapularis. So releasing the subscap can be very important. And some of the interesting things about subscap is that it sends a slip and a thread that interfaces with the long head of biceps tendon. So if someone has internal rotation dysfunction, they will often have biceps, long head of biceps dysfunction at the same time. And as that progresses, supraspinatus also sends a supportive slip on either side of long head's bicep. So you end up a scenario where there's both internal and external rotation dysfunction and the long head of the bicep is the culprit stuck in the middle. So you start to get people who are weak in both directions and it's a messy picture. And that's why this algorithm that Bidorf put together sort of speaks to that. If someone, if it's unclear, think bicep, but the biceps probably got a dysfunction involving supraspinatus and subscap over time. All right. So, so but in, in, yeah, the, the one in context to that, Dr. McDonald, like with the biceps load test and the apprehension test where you you said you can find out if a friend or the biceps is involved, but how will you train the biceps as a stabilizer in that situation? That's the question. <clears throat> well, think eccentrically, but you find where the person can function. What you'll often find is that someone is, if they're in supination, and you resist contraction, it stabilizes. But you put them in pronation and they resist contraction, you've changed the length tension of the long head bicep and they can't stabilize anymore. That's sort of like almost a friend, but a bit of a foe. Uh, what would I do with individuals? Well, they start to do slow eccentric retraining of the bicep in scaption, initially supinated. Over time, as they get better at controlling that, then I will pronate them and create a length tension then I might change the position in the window they're in. Expectation is as you either come forward or you come backward out of that midpoint of scapular plane window, it's gonna be harder for that biceps to do its job, especially as you move towards abduction. And so that's slow isometric holds can be utilized. Then you can start to have it during range and then start moving them. So they're in a position where the biceps is, is more and more compromised you could turn the head away, which will change the cervical motor control as they do it. You could initially have them do it in head neutral, scapular mid plane, supinated, split stance, upright thoracic. It's gonna be the easiest place for them to, and the elbow resting on the big ball. That's gonna be the easiest place to start. In the long run, they need to be able to do it looking away, feet square, which is not functional, but if they can do it like this, they don't really have any bicep dysfunction left. I, my biceps is not happy of me doing that twice, but that's, so if you start with the most functional position, people will tend to at least have some ability. And over time you move to demands of their task. All right. Uh, one last question, Dr. McDonald, and uh, participant wants to know that you showed some C4, C5 resetting for deep neck flexors mm -hmm. in, in the video. Can they just want to review this particular thing that you did for resetting C4, C5 for deep deep flexors? Yeah. yeah, so I know like it's what I was doing with that individual was basically they had weakness in C5 myotome. And when I went in and put my hands on the neck, if I came round, if I, if I basically came round behind C45 and created a little anterior glide, the weakness got worse. 
Pá. What I would then do is basically be like, all right, you got that position, don't clench your teeth, and then try to posteriorly rotate the cranium. And that would create an anterior engagement demand of the deep cervical longus, longus coli and it was associated musculature. As soon as the individual could feel those motor units engage, then I go back and test their arm again. And in her case, it was like, I don't have weakness anymore and my neck no longer hurts. And I can feel it working. That's one way to do it. Seated, a little harder to do, a simplified way to do it. I have videos elsewhere, but basically you lay someone supine, you put your hands underneath at the spinous process of C5, and you just anteriorly glide it and ask them, can you stop me doing it? They probably can't. Practice a little craniocervical flexion and deep neck flexion. And now do it again. Let me just anteriorly glide spinous process C5. The person might be able to isometrically start to block that movement. That's when they're starting to regain some of that control segmentally. Now, can we be totally segmental? No, we can't, but should we try? I think we should because, but the trick is the function changes. If you can change someone's function in their arm by having them work with their neck motor control, they're starting to do something purposeful and they can actually feel it. I want patients to feel what they're working on and also how it changes their function. So they're very motivated to work on exercises and not simply to do what you ask because they like you. All right, all right. Uh, I'm sorry for my background disturbance over there, but there are a lot of questions actually, Dr. McDonald, regarding the regional interdependence, but I will, uh, I would uh, let you wrap, wrap up this. And guys, yes, as Dr. McDonald say, and we also in our program, manual therapy program talks about regional interdependence, neurokinetic chain, neuromusculoskeletal kinetic chain, where your cervical spine, thoracic spine, including your ribs, can have an impact on the shoulder and the scapular movement. So we that's why shoulder is not like a one day thing. You need to kind of connect the dots of cervical spine, thoracic spine, cervical thoracic, a lot of systematic reviews for cervical thoracic and shoulder connections and ribs and all. So if you really want to learn and connecting these dots in manual therapy from our US experts like Dr. McDonald and Dr. Stephen and all, you're welcome to sign up for our manual therapy program. You can see for our website, theisom.com. The quiz link has been shared. Uh, and Dr. McDonald was kind enough to share a very tricky quiz with us for those 10 MCQ, MC, uh, MCQs there. That was like so nice and simple question. <laughs> so yeah, not very simple, but uh, sure, the WhatsApp group, uh, the quiz link has been shared guys. And if you have any other questions and concerns, you're welcome to get back to our uh, contact information. You can see our website, theisom.com, which is running very fast now. <laughs> I, had a, I had a glitch in the morning. Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. McDonald, for your valuable time and for this shoulder plane scaption, like your hipption was there in the last lecture for the hip, hipption, and now this scaption and all the shoulder functional plane assessment. We really thank you and we hope to see you again and you can have the final word, sir, uh, for in. Well, thank you, PK. And yes, this today was about getting you thinking. And yes, I ran into scaption in the early 90s. That name already existed. When I started to really think about hip function, that's when I, well, I need a name for this. So, so I think you now know where hip came from. But yes, the shoulder is beautifully complicated, all the connections. And so you don't, you're not gonna solve it in a day but you are gonna solve it in your career and every bit of improvement you make will make your job more rewarding and you'll be able to benefit the people that you serve even more. So thank you for your time. Keep learning and maybe I'll see you again. All right. Sure, Thanks so and these, Bye -bye. These lectures, yeah, thank you so much. These lectures are really helping people because one of the parts when got back to us that medial hip glide was really helpful for the patient. So these lectures are really helping people to treat their patients better, sir. Thank you so much. All, All right. right, thank you. Thank good you so much, guys. Take care, have a good day. Have a good week. We will see you in the next lecture. Thank you. Thanks. Sir.